Well, good evening. It looks like we are live, so we will get started. Hello and welcome to everyone who's joining us tonight for this virtual town hall about child and youth health. My name is Rebecca Garcia and I'm the president of the Nevada Parent Teacher Association. Um, and I look forward to tonight's, to tonight's conversation. We have a wonderful panel um, with great experience and I'm looking forward to the discussion that we have. So first I'd like to welcome um, Leanne McAllister from the Nevada chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Leanne is the executive director and a parent to a beautiful but complicated special needs adopted teenage foster son currently enrolled in the Clark County Public Schools. Before she moved to Nevada in 2018, um, she ran her husband's pediatric practice in suburban Boston for 10 years, where she supported many parents in navigating their child's health needs while at school. Welcome, Leanne. Thank you for having me. And we also have Heidi Parker from Immunize Nevada. She is the executive director of the Immunize Nevada a statewide nonprofit coalition dedicated to promoting health and preventing disease. Under her leadership, Immunize Nevada is deeply engaged in community outreach, collaborative projects, and advocacy efforts aimed at helping close the vaccination gap in the Nevada in Nevada. Heidi is a second generation DePaul Blue Demon. Go DePaul. My nephew went there too, so. Um, and received her master's degree from Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville. And many years ago, this part I like, she added this in for us, was a PTA officer up at Marvin Moss Elementary in Sparks, Nevada. PTA follows you everywhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you. And then we also have Dr. Tiffany Tyler Garner from the Children's Advocacy Alliance. She has recently joined CAA as their executive director, which is a community-based nonprofit organization advocating for policy changes to improve conditions for Nevada's children and families. As an educational psychologist, published researcher, and nonprofit leader, Dr. Tyler Garner is deeply engaged in advocacy, policy, and the delivery of transformative human services. Dr. Tyler Garner has a doctorate in educational psychology from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, a master's of science in counseling from California State University, Northridge, and a BA in psychology and sociology from the University of Southern California. Dr. Tyler routinely serves as a thought partner and expert in the areas of education, human services, and workforce development. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Tyler Gardner. Good evening, and thank you for having me. So um, this discussion tonight um, is really a broad topic, and I appreciate all of you joining us for this conversation. Um, you know, PTA is committed to our mission, which is to help every child reach their full potential. Um, and we do that by engaging with parents, teachers, and the community. And so we've covered a lot of topics in these virtual town halls. Some have been really related to the pandemic. Um, and we, as we were looking at what we wanted to talk about next, um, we really wanted to cover child health because while some of it does link back to the pandemic and some issues that have really risen to the forefront, and there's a lot of ongoing issues and challenges and needs in our state related to child health um, that existed well before the pandemic and are going to continue to. And so we really wanted to look at not just current issues, but also that broader lens of how can we bring some of these issues to the forefront and talk about them more um, to hopefully move that conversation forward. Um, and so I wanted to kind of start there. And this is a question for all of you, because I'm sure each of you will bring a little different answer to this. Um, the pandemic obviously has brought public health issues into a spotlight, but across our state, um, children's health policy issues are, again, like I said, many were existing beforehand. And so what are some of the focus areas that each of your organizations really see a need to have attention on in the broader range scale and both now and as we move into a legislative session. I'll start with Heidi. Thank you. Um, you know, I think for us, just looking both now during the pandemic, but also ahead to session is 
you know, we're really concerned about public health funding in this state. Um, that not only affects obviously immunization delivery and access, but it affects everything, you know, that we're probably going to talk about tonight. And I think it has really come to light, you know, in our, um, uh, unfortunately, currently, you know, in this pandemic with some of the struggles that we're seeing, you know, across our communities. Um, it's been a priority in past sessions, and so we fully expect uh, to see that back um, back at the top of the list this coming session. Leanne, what would you share on that? Well, I join Heidi in the need for funding, uh, having access for every child to have access to a medical home where they have a primary care provider that is um, doing the appropriate developmental screens, mental health screens, uh, preventative vaccinations, having access to care, it starts with funding. If we don't have enough funding, we can't attract enough providers and have that access to care. Um, but in addition to the funding, I had an interesting uh, meeting with the other chapter leaders from the American Academy of Pediatrics, and they're all talking about how their school systems were closed. And I said, yeah, well, Washoe's closed, not because of the COVID, but because of the air pollution. And I think mm -hmm. that is a major concern for the members of my chapter. Um, in addition, uh, kids uh, vaping and other tobacco use products, um, they're starting those habits in childhood and um, our chapter is focused on intervention and obesity is also a major concern for my chapter members right now. And our chapter does a lot of pro programs to uh, get families moving. Yeah, um, I know PTAs across the country have um, been looking at that issue of vaping as well because it is, it seems so fast that it became so prevalent among youth. And, you know, I think all of us are of the generation where, uh, we, we got the information, but in a much different way. And then now all of a sudden it's our kids that you're like, oh, what, we have to do this again? Um, because it's, it's a different conversation um, that it has to happen now. You're right. Dr. Tyler Gardner. I would echo those sentiments, particularly the continuing need to ensure healthcare access. And then beyond that saying this upcoming session, given the uh, lateness of this pandemic, a need to expand, well, minimally maintain, but expand a number of the safety nets that we uh, typically leverage to ensure family well-being and, and child safety, whether it's looking at um, how we go about this recovery, including ensuring that we invest in our child care centers, because it'll be critical to folks' ability to return to work, or just looking at the need for continuous coverage during a, a time like this. I would say not only healthcare, but a, a, key, a, a attention to the ways in which things like housing stability, food insecurity, uh, unemployment, and the resulting loss of, of employer-sponsored uh, health insurance are impacting families. And then you layer on top of that, uh, even just considering that, because I think about the small P as well, what are ways in which we are supporting parents to manage the demands of working while supporting education. So even employer family, family um, policies and practices, mm -hmm. to help, whether that's paid leave or other things, really a need to uh, deeply consider what recovery means holistically. Yeah, no, I think you pointed out some really powerful things. Um, as I mentioned before we hopped on the live, um, my background is in nonprofit management over different years and I've gotten to work with Shriners and Red Cross and others. And um, you bring up some points that I've seen. Um, it was interesting in my work in nonprofits, but then moving into the education space and PTA, um, how many, when it comes to education and children's health, all of the things that are linked, it is housing, it is employment, it is, um, you know, there's, all of these pieces are like a puzzle that interact together and really impact kids and the services that they get. Um, and in Nevada, obviously we have some struggles in making sure that all kids get what they need because we have some really high need populations um, in our state. 
And so I wanted to go, um, Dr. Tyler Gardner, to the Children's Report Card for Nevada that is available on the Children's Advocacy Alliance website, which I think is really helpful to look at. And Nevada received a grade of C minus in safety and a D in health. Um, can you explain some of the factors that make up those grades and where the focus would need to be to see an improvement? Yes, I would, with a few caveats. So one, I'd like to know that a number of indicators comprise each of those uh, rankings. So it's not just a sole, sole measure mm -hmm. around health or safety. Things like uh, in the case of health, mental health, sexual health, dental health, childhood obesity, immunizations, parental and infant health are indicators that comprise that uh, ranking. In the case of safety, things like juvenile uh, violence, child mal maltreatment and youth homelessness comprise those indicators. And uh, more if, uh, as another consideration, it's important to note these rankings are a comparison in relation to other states. So in instances where a national trend may be heading in uh, the same direction we're headed in, we may not get the credit for that improvement in the ways that we would think about it. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, uh, as you consider some of these rankings, it's important to note it's in relation to others. It, there are a number of factors that contribute to it. But each of those represent an opportunity uh, to really get engaged and improve some of those conditions. So in the case of uh, health, we actually saw some improvements in things like access to health care, immunizations, health and sexual health, but mental health remained the same. It's also important to note that the da data that we're looking at on the currently posted report card is prior to the pandemic. And actually there is a new release slated for this Monday. So we're gonna encourage people yeah. to, to turn in, uh, turn, tune in on uh, Monday at 11 to hear more about where we are in some of these areas. But with that considered, some of the things that we hope folks take from this report card is one, the need to ensure holistic, equitable approaches to health and child well-being that include preparation for some of the social determinants of health whether that's things like uh, uh, safe housing or opportunities for economic growth or employment or social supports, all these things contribute to uh, child well-being, uh, safety and family well-being. And so from that point, we want to encourage you to, whether you represent a system or organization or just a very concerned parent, ask where are the opportunities for us as individuals, communities, and systems to really move the needle on some of these issues. Something like child obesity that actually declined as a, uh, during that uh, period of time. Um, that is so complex that there are any number of opportunities to intervene, whether that's looking at families living in food deserts or as food affordability uh, declines, our folks pivoting to uh, low cost, but high, high fat, high sugar kind of diets, right. or in a climate like this, where some of the traditional ways that we would be encouraging exercise, like getting out yeah. and playing with others or extracurricular activity, yeah. how are we ensuring that some other activity happening that allow uh, or support healthful practices? Yeah. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons we, um, these town halls are planned by our advocacy team and we wanted to bring up child health because there are so many of these different pieces and the more we think about it we can see ways that we can make a difference you know I have three kids at home and I can tell you that their physical activity has dropped <laughs> considerably um, now that the weather's improving um, I we're hoping to increase that more but it's those things that sometimes you don't think about initially and then you do more and I want to get, go back to something, Leanne, you said in the beginning that I really liked, that you want every child to have a medical home, I think it is the term that you uh, said. And I love that because I can tell you, I pick my insurance. I just, just we just, my husband and I, we just did our uh, annual enrollment, you know, where you have to go pick a, your election again. Um, and I pick my insurance based on my pediatrician, 100%. I will follow him 
that is how I choose my insurance. hundred percent is for my kid's pediatrician because um, he is a partner for me. I have kids who have some special needs when it comes to healthcare and, and behavioral health. And he's such an amazing partner for me that I will make that choice. But I know that in Nevada, that's rare, I think, for a lot of families, they kind of struggle with that. So what are some ways that you think we can make an improvement in that? And because it does, when you feel like you have a doctor you can go to for your kids, I, I think I, the, the, the quality of care they get is better. Um, when I know that I have a positive relationship with my kid's physician. Well, I think where we struggle here in Nevada are the uninsured and the underinsured. And when families, um, we have a weekly meeting with all the chapter leaders in the American Academy of Pediatrics and they present data to us. It is so heartwarming how much parents do trust their pediatrician. In study after study, they, um, they, they rely on their pediatrician, they trust their pediatrician, they're bringing questions about anxiety and physical health and everything else to the pediatrician. For the families that have that, it works well, but our concern is for the families that don't have access to, um, to Medicaid or to Healthy Start Nevada or whatever program is out there. Um, and uh, we recently started a committee on immigrant health for families that are afraid to access the healthcare system um, for fear of uh, deportation of a family member. So uh, working on legislative protections for families um, to be able to enroll in care uh, right away and not have to wait. I think it's, through, I, Heidi knows the legislation better than I do. I think it's uh, the number of years before they can access some of the public service. And the name of the game in primary care is to diagnose on time. I mean, that's one of our biggest concerns right now with COVID is families are hesitant to leave the home and go to the doctor's office, but that delay in diagnosis is a delay in intervention. And um, something that is highly effectively treatable today might not be in six to 12 months. Yeah, that's, um, I think we, I was gonna ask some questions later, but I think that is a good time to put this because this falls really well into both Heidi and Lee and things that your organizations are really focused on. Um, I know even I, I delayed my kids well check in the spring because her birthday was in, my youngest birthday was in May. And I was like, we're not going to the doctor just for the heck of it. That was, I, that was kind of my perception then. And then when I did go <clears throat> recently and had a great conversation with my pediatrician, I went, oh, I probably should have gone in. Um, so um, <clears throat> what are the recommendations for parents right now for um, both immunizations and well checks and, and how can we reassure parents who are concerned about potentially increased exposure by making that hospital visit, or not hospital visit, the doctor's visit? Heidi, do you want to start with immunizations? Sure. Um, so we have seen, a, I would say, a significant decline in, in the number of immunizations, unfortunately, you know, since uh, we uh, started kind of those stay-at-home orders in early March. Um, I think back to school definitely helped get a lot of um, those kids back on track, but we are still seeing um, some lagging numbers. And unfortunately, um, as, as mentioned, is those numbers are in some of those really high risk, those uninsured um, are families that are already experiencing other health disparities or other social determinants of health. And so adding to to that, we don't want them right to experience, you know, a vaccine preventable disease or illness. So I think for us, helping those families understand that it's imperative, you know, to get back on schedule. Um, and then I think Leanne can talk about this, but it is safe to come in to that doctor's office. They're going to tell you what they're doing um, to keep you and your family safe. We have um, some parent stories on our blog, actually. So we interviewed a number of parents who brought their babies and their toddlers and their kids into the doctor um, during the pandemic and talked about how safe they felt and comfortable and all the things that were put in place. Um, but as we get through this, you know, we don't want to come out on the other end with another outbreak in Nevada and 
it is just so important that we stay up on the vaccines that we do have right now that we can, you know, the diseases we can prevent. Um, that's really where our focus is and helping parents understand just how important it is. Yeah, the American Academy of Pediatrics was calling it, you know, a potential twindemic that we'd go mm -hmm. from the pandemic from and then having an extra um, outbreak. And, and we've also launched a campaign, Call Your Pediatrician. If you are nervous or concerned about visiting the office, call ahead when you make that appointment or when you confirm that appointment and ask them what precautions they're taking or also what they'll allow you to do. Some will allow you to do the administrative part from home. So you don't have to stand in the waiting room mm -hmm. filling out the paperwork. Um, some will even bring the vaccine out to the vehicle, which I've heard from a number of pediatricians is great because the kid's in the car seat and it's so much easier <laughs> than when their child's squirming on the pediatrician's lap. Um, we, we could we could have used that for my nine-year-old at her last appointment, <laughs> but no more car seats there. <laughs> no, no, um, but uh, pediatricians, physicians, they have PPE. They know how to use PPE. Um, the one good piece of advice um, I saw from another chapter was to bring your own board book or a toy that can be sanitized so that your child is not reaching for anything in the waiting room. Although I think at this point, the waiting rooms have been emptied of, of communal toys, um, but, but call ahead and ask what is the mask policy? What, and, um, and you'll, you'll be surprised that most of the offices can help you to make arrangements, especially the practices that have more than one location. There might be some locations that are catering more, especially to kids with special needs, right? At this time, we are worried about um, kids with cancer diagnosis, cystic fibrosis, um, any kind of chronic disease that puts them at higher risk. Um, offices are setting aside times where the, only those kids are coming in and not the rest of the population. So call your pediatrician and, and they'll walk you through it. Um, one of the other things I've, I've noticed that I don't think I took advantage of as much before the pandemic is the virtual options for questions, you know, whether it's submitting an e-visit or the telehealth um, for some of those quick questions, I forget sometimes that those are available and so many healthcare um, providers are making those more an option. Um, but I think sometimes as parents, we get so busy with life that we forget that sometimes the easy things can be done um, with an e-visit and then it doesn't delay the same way. Um, Let's go, um, since we were talking about a vac vaccinations, Heidi, the flu vaccine. So there's been a lot of, I've noticed a lot more PSAs and drive-through clinics and that happening with the flu vaccine. Um, why is getting a flu shot recommended? And especially for kids, there's concern um, if, they, if they get the vaccine, are they gonna get sick? Um, and, and is it needed for kids? Those are all really great questions. Um, so I think first and foremost, um, the flu is, I think we just need to be honest about it. It is a deadly disease and it is um, every year we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of hospitalizations. Um, we just had the highest number of pediatric deaths we've had um, this last flu season. So it is, extra important, I would say, for kids, especially those under five. Um, flu vaccine is a universal recommendation. It's recommended for six months and older, but we definitely have groups within that that we want to make sure are getting the flu vaccine. Pregnant women, um, elderly, again, those chronic um, health conditions. And I think the important thing with that too is when we're thinking about the flu shot, it's not just about us, right? It's about those other people around us who maybe can't get it because they are in cancer treatment or they have another condition. They need us to protect them. So it's, we're protecting ourselves, but we're also protecting the ones we love in our community. So I think just this time right now, um, it's probably more important than ever that we get our flu vaccines. Um, we, with the level of hospitalization that we've seen in past flu seasons, we don't have the resources to deal with that on top of what our hospitals and our public health system are dealing with already, you know, with COVID-19. 
So by getting vaccinated and doing our part, we're really helping lessen the burden you know, on our systems. Um, I think a lot of times the flu has, uh, people think, oh, it's just a bad cold. But the thing about flu is it's really unpredictable and you just don't know how it's going to affect you. Um, healthy kids, healthy adults, um, unfortunately they do die from flu. Um, so I really look at getting a flu shot. It's like a seatbelt, right? You don't put your seatbelt on after the accident. You put it on before. And that's, it's an easy, quick, it's pretty much no cost in Nevada, no matter what your situation is, whether you have no insurance or you have insurance, it's, we have plenty of resources to help with that. Um, and I think the consequences of being off of work without pay, um, missing all of you know school days, et cetera, um, they can be very, very costly for families. And again, on top of what they're already dealing with with the pandemic, we just don't want anybody to have to add that burden. Um, so this kind of leads into stuff you guys have already touched on, but I want to talk some about resources and how families can um, get access, because obviously that's a big conversation we've had, and I'm guessing all of you can probably touch on some of this, um, but Nevada has a lot of transient families. We have a lot of people that move to, I've been surprised how many people have moved to Nevada during the pandemic, um, dealing a lot with families in Clark County. I've been surprised how many have come here. Um, and so uh, what are some of the challenges that that presents? Maybe starting with Dr. Tyler Garner, um, what are your, some of your thoughts on that, on how transiency impacts health and how we as a community can respond to that? And then I'll go and ask Leanne and Heidi some follow-up about maybe some services and Dr. T um, Tyler Garner, if you have um, any information on how people can access services, feel free to share too. But just kind of that topic of as people are moving, as we have so many different populations to serve, getting access and, um, and making sure everybody's needs are met. Housing instability has the potential to negatively impact many domains of anyone's um, uh, life experience, whether it's the ability to uh, maintain employment or a, a stable permanent address to receive mail and follow-up <laughs> notifications about appointments or things of that nature, that or um, mm -hmm. just the psychological well-being that comes from knowing that you have a roof over your head and a place that you can come to daily and fall asleep at night. Uh, housing stability is just absolutely uh, critical. And at a time where we are grappling with this moratorium and nearly seven in 10 are reporting either anxiety or fears about either foreclosures or, foreclosures or eviction, um, being able to leverage community resources becomes even more critical. There, there is a network of supports out there, whether it's a family resource centers that are located throughout our community that's really an underutilized service uh, or place. They provide things like basic needs in terms of utility assistance or rental assistance or food assistance or our, our banks. Or in the case of our children, even while they are learning from home, organizations like communities and schools that are providing wraparound services and taking those resources out to households, there, there are some supports out there. But I can't underscore enough the um, critical need for us as a community to look at housing um, stability for families and what affordability means. Because even prior to our uh, pandemic, uh, housing affordability was declining in our state. We were becoming you know, more and more expensive to just even rent. And now with these in transitions in employment and other things, uh, transiency has become more of an issue. In a previous role, um, I served as the head of a dropout prevention organization where uh, as a part of our work, we would be, uh, we experienced families that literally moved in what we call a circle of affordability from one um, rental special to another or living in weeklies where at the end of each week, they were pressed to determine if they could come up with the rent for the next from living out of backpacks. The ability to consistently turn in homework or to focus during class or to stay on the immunization schedule yeah. um, becomes encumbered in those situations. So I can't, um, 
employ us enough as we go into this next legislative session, or as you hear those calls to invest better in some of these systems, that now more than ever, there is a need to invest in those systems, including uh, ensuring housing stability for families. Yeah. Um, I live on the east side of Las Vegas, and I have for the last 14 years, and I still remember probably 13 or 14 years ago, driving by a weekly on Boulder Highway at school bus time and a school bus pulled up and picked up an entire bus load of kids. And um, I, I was new to Vegas. I didn't I didn't have, a, I guess at that point I would have been married. So I had a fifth grader um, a stepdaughter that I had, but I, I, how many of our kids are living in more transient housing without that stability, um, it has always been um, really mind blowing to me because it does impact so many other things. And like, if you're trying to figure out how to pay for housing and you have to come up with a copay to go to the doctor, which not all insurances do, but some do, right? There, there's a lot of those trade-offs that um, families are being asked to make that make it really hard. Um, Heidi, we talked about immunization records and the challenge uh, sometimes of keeping up on that schedule, but I know Immunize Nevada actually makes it really easy to access um, immunization records. So I didn't want to have this conversation without giving you time to plug how we as families, and it doesn't, you don't have to be transient. You could be like me and not do well with paper um, and be really grateful for digital access to records. So how do we get those records for our kids? You know, I think a lot of times Nevada um, is always, you know, criticized for being at the bottom of some lists and not doing well with things. However, um, we have an amazing immunization registry in our state and kudos to our state program for all the work they've done over the years to ensure not only that that system is so robust, but they added that public portal, you know, a few years ago. Um, so there's a couple ways. So you have internet access and um, wherever you get vaccinated, whether that's at a pediatrician's office, an, another clinic, um, the health district, uh, um, a community clinic, you know, they can put in your uh, mobile phone or your email into that record. And then now that public portal is set up with that two-factor authentication. And so it's, you go in, you put in some information, it matches that up and then you can access your child's record. And because our registry is a lifespan registry, our own adult records are in there too if you've gotten a, even just a flu vaccine in Nevada. Um, but for families that don't have that access or sometimes it just doesn't work because that information is not in the record yet, um, Immunize Nevada has trained um, staff and volunteers that can assist with that record lookup. And so families can call us, they can email us, and then we'll work with them on getting that record to them. It's really helpful for back to school. Providers are typically overwhelmed <laughs> ahead of back to school and they may not have the ability to be printing off records and doing these things. So that's a great way for us to step in and help relieve some of that burden it relieves burden on the schools because then they're not trying to track the records down. Um, and so we really, um, we provide that service to anyone in Nevada. Um, we actually also, speaking to people moving here, um, we, this particular school year, our staff did some amazing work helping families track down records from other states and getting in touch um, with programs like ours. But we had one family that was literally gonna fly back because they needed their records and they were just challenged with how to access them. We got on the phone, a few emails, and we helped them get in touch with, uh, with those records and they didn't have to um, take that flight and, and invest that money that they probably didn't have, you know, honestly. So we, I, I say our team goes above and beyond to really help students get those records so they can start school on time because that's, a lot of the times parents are looking for those records, right? Is something that it's camp, it's school for yeah. old kids. Yeah, it's let's be college. honest. We generally go look for them when we have to have them and it's yes. generally not a lot of lead time, right? It's yeah. like, I need this this week. And Absolutely. Now I have <laughs> and I, um, and I, I think just being able to be that friendly voice on the other line or on that other 
side of that email to help that family. It just makes a big difference. Um, and with that, do, and this may be, I'm not sure who's the best person, but also like if you've gotten behind in the vaccination schedule or well checkups, um, what is the recommendation to kind of get caught up on that? And how can families figure that out? Um, I think Leanne can probably talk about that too, but I would, I would just say, you know, with that provider shortage and, and sometimes the challenges of getting in to uh, an office, the benefit of immunizations is we do have a lot of other options in Nevada. Um, so we have um, our health districts. We, if parents have insurance, you know, our pharmacies do vaccinate here in our state. Um, so there's mobile clinics, you know, depending on where you live. So there are a lot of options for vaccines and Nevada participates in the Vaccines for Children program, which is a program that provides no cost vaccines to families who qualify. And I think that's especially important for families who have potentially lost their insurance during the pandemic and are afraid of, you know, they have a perception it might cost a lot, but with that uninsured status, then we're able to help them through that program. So I think just finding a resource near you, um, but AAP has a great locator. There's a lot of resources out there that I think can connect families to get back on track. Yeah, so on the family section of the Nevada chapter AAP website, we do have a find a, per, a pediatrician um, locator. So you can find primary care and specialty care pediatricians near you, um, which when you have insurance is great, but if you don't, that can be a challenge. I know a lot of our chapter leadership does recommend families contact the Nevada Health Link. So the Nevada Health Link is tasked with helping families find free or low cost insurance to help pay for um, health care that they need. Um, and um, to bring this full circle back to what D Tyler Gardner was talking about, another great resource I know pediatricians turn families onto is Nevada 211. So when families really don't know how are you dealing with the eviction, how do you get legal help, how do you find food sources, that they will turn them to Nevada 211 as a resource. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, Nevada 211, it is amazing. You literally, it is nevada211.org is the website, but you can also just call 211 and they have operators that will um, answer so many different social service questions. Um, and I, I don't know that enough people realize that resources out there. Um, because it is a great resource. Um, and um, we, we touched on insurance. Nevada does offer free insurance for kids in some cases, correct? Mm -hmm. So there are programs where people could call the Nevada Health Link to look and see whether or not your kids would qualify for free insurance or low cost insurance. Um, and is that something that families can access now if they've had a job loss? Because I think that's a big question, you know. Yes. Obviously, we've said it. So they so, can, so if they've had a change in job status, they could reach out for that. A loss of insurance is a qualifying uh, event for uh, getting new insurance outside of the open enrollment period. Okay. And then on the Immunize Nevada site, we have a section about finding a provider. Most of the list is uh, for families that are uninsured or adults that are uninsured. But then we also have some additional information about help for pain for vaccines, what those programs look like. And then we also link to Nevada Health Link as well from that same section. So again, we know when people are looking for resources, often they're probably needing more than just trying to get their kids vaccinated, right? So at, we're partnering flu shot clinics with food distributions. We give out Nevada 211 information. So we're, we're always trying to pair as much information as we can when um, our services are being accessed as well. Thank you. Um, I want to pivot a little bit to the topic of mental health. Um, which um, Dr. Tyler Gardner, your degree is in educational psychology and your school counseling. So I'm sure this is a topic that you are well acquainted with, but it's been, um, you know, rising 
with the pandemic, it seems like we're hearing so much more isolation, depression, anxiety. Um, in Southern Nevada, we're hearing headlines of increased completed youth suicides. Um, with all of these things that are happening, what recommendations do you have for families? Um, especially, I think there's a lot of parents right now who are just concerned, like, how do I know the signs? How do I figure out if my kid needs help? How do I figure out who to go to? Um, so what would you share in that, that vein? Check in, never uh, be afraid to ask for help and embrace support. Um, and particularly depending on <laughs> your children. I can tell you as a mother of two CCSD graduates, there were times where they didn't want me to. And I had to ensure <laughs> that I wasn't dissuaded by that. Because as you know, now more than ever with the uh, social distancing that's happening and the isolation that others are experiencing, we have seen a market increase that is concerning, particularly among our youth. It's important to know that there are resources out there so you don't have to be alone in it. Um, and given the climate that we're in, things like being feeling anxious or maybe having anxiety or being saddened by what's happening or actually being maybe uh, more of the norm now and you're likely not alone mm -hmm. in those feelings. And so as a part of that uh, shared experience having together, uh, I think I would ask all of us to make it safe and acceptable for others to say that they're not, that they're not okay, that they're not feeling well, and to affirm that in a time like this, that may be normal because these are unusual, unprecedented times. There are resources out there, particularly as we talk about our children and youth, even though they may not be uh, fully in school now, there is a counselor that if you reached out to or a social worker on campus, and even wraparound programs that provide services like communities and schools. There are a number of folks who are prepared and armed to help. And um, because there's been a greater focus on healthcare access, uh, don't let um, how will I pay for the help my child may need be a barrier mm -hmm. to, to seeking the help. Even before the pandemic, there were resources out there like UNLV's practice where there was a sliding scale and other resources in the community around uh, counseling, but I, I can't underscore enough that we should normalize making it okay to get help, to give voice to our fears and concerns, and to and, uh, affirm for others that they are not alone in it, and to remind ourselves that we are not. And so it's critical to, to check in, ask for help, and stay engaged. And uh, in the case of your children, until they get connected, even <laughs> if they resist. As someone who, who had teenagers at one point, let me just say that that seemed to be a part of our relationship, but I would have been absolutely heartbroken if I, if I settled on their seventh no, if the eighth no would have worked or prevented them from harming themselves or others. I, I think that's really good advice. I have a big age gap in my kids. So my oldest is 25 and my youngest is nine. And I'm getting ready to redo the teenage years again with the 13 year old. Um, and uh, it, it, it's amazing those things that you have to remind yourself as a parent sometimes. Um, and, and I appreciate that you brought up that we need to normalize not just what's happening right now and everybody's feelings that are happening right now, but also just the need for mental health services. Um, because I think a lot of people still feel like there's a stigma attached to mental health or, or having a label for a diagnosis. Um, and Leanne, I know that's one thing too. Some, um, you know, that one of the reasons I follow my pediatrician is I have kids who have ADHD and anxiety and my pediatrician is incredibly good about um, treating my whole child. Um, you know, he sees the whole picture of my kids. Um, and so how, has there been an evolving recommendations from the from pediatricians? It seems like there's been progress on that front where they're, you're getting more questions from pediatricians about kids' emotional and behavioral health. It's, mm -hmm. it, it is a normal part of um, 
the Bright Futures Well Child Check, which is the American Academy of Pediatrics gold standard for what is involved in a well child check. Um, before our conversation here, I was checking healthychildren.org, which is the parenting website um, for anxiety resources. And um, there's a statistic that one out of three teens has an anxiety disorder, but the very next fact is they're highly treatable. They're highly addressable. And um, before our call, I checked with my husband and son and said, can we talk, can I talk about our family doing telehealth, behavioral health? Because I think if more people just talk about it, it would remove the stigma. And my 17 year old son said, what stigma? Because I think to him and to his age group, he has no, um, he's never uncomfortable talking about his needs for addressing um, his anxiety and those sorts of things, which um, I haven't seen a lot of data on it, but just hearing him say that made me feel great that he, it's part of his normal health as if he had asthma or any other health concern. This is how we treat that health concern. Yeah, um, I think that, that if we can all get to that point, mm -hmm. I think we would see significant progress because like Dr. Tyler Garner said, like um, sometimes I think we don't reach out for help because we think there's a difference or there is something attached to it. But if we recognize that there are so many different things people are going through and that there are services available, it makes a big difference. Um, I want to um, shift gears just a little bit. November, which can you guys believe it's almost November? I feel like, <laughs> I don't know, before we hopped down, we talked about how long 2020 feels. <laughs> it feels like it's been very long, but um, November's almost here and National PTA, it's actually health, Healthy Lifestyle Month. Um, and we emphasize the importance of unplugging and getting proper exercise and nutrition. Um, and this year that feels like it's going to be a little different because especially like here in Clark County, as well as other places, our kids are online more than ever because school is online. Mm -hmm. Um, so how would all of you, and I think you all would probably give different ideas on this, but how would you suggest families encourage healthy choices for kids um, with all the screen time um, and less time that's been happening being active and that feel so many, like you said, the normal activities might change. So how do we still encourage healthy habits and even healthy nutrition um, when sometimes maybe families are relying on food distribution whether it's from school or community food banks. I'll let anybody jump in first. I would say like anything else, it's important to have a plan and a plan that includes alternatives. And so if you are some to playing football, is there an opportunity to get engaged with yoga as an activity <laughs> that can happen in your living room and a part of that process. And um, having the courage to look inward and be sensitive uh, to your needs, I think is another key part of that process. So just like we eat when we're hungry or we rest when we're tired, when you are feeling emotionally uh, disconnected or distant, it's okay to attend to that and have a plan. I remember uh, less than 30 days ago, I thought, man, I miss dining with my friends and family. And it occurred to me that just like I Zoomed for work, I could have Zoomed with my mom and aunts like every day if I wanted to, had I pivoted to say, here's an alternative way of engaging with others. So I think it's an opportunity to kind of uh, get a little more strategic about how we go about it because it's not gonna just happen uh, serendipitously or vicariously, right? There's no like walking down the hall to, to connect with folks or ask how things are going yeah. in or walking to the, the eatery nearby unless you make some intention. So even things like, can I get a lap going around this house for these kids? Like, can <laughs> we just do a race around the, the backyard? And could, as a part of that activity, could they actually mark off the racetrack in the backyard? Like, first you're going to make it, and then we're going to practice using it as some, some strategies. And to begin to tie it to some of those concepts like that we use over the course of our lifespan, just good coping. Like, where am mm -hmm. I? I call it pies, like where am I physically, intellectually, uh, emotionally, um, as, uh, some of the uh, letters of that acronym, just how, where am I? And do I have a plan in each of those areas that allow me to do something else other than what I was doing? And in some ways, we make some better choices. 
So when I could go out and eat with others, maybe I was emotionally eating when I was stressed out. <laughs> now I'm gonna journal, <laughs> right? <laughs> And then I'm going to call someone on Zoom and say, girl, can you tell me what's your, what were the three things that were on your list? Since we're accountability partners now, I just walked around the living room for 15 minutes. How about you? <laughs> having a, a alternatives, I think it's a, a, a good first step. I, I've said several times that I'm not sure how this will all impact when our kids look back on this in 20, 30 years, but I actually do hope that the one thing that most, some, I think one kid thing kids can get out of it is resiliency. Um, it, that uh, they they're learning at a really pivotal time in life uh, that life doesn't always go the way you expect it to, <laughs> um, and those coping skills, like you said, are so important. And sometimes as parents, that's a, a good reminder for us that we have to we have to walk our kids through what those are and how to use them. That's part of developing and learning. And uh, that can be hard when we ourselves feel overwhelmed, um, but it can make a huge difference. Anybody else want to share? I know um, I, I know this because I had this conversation with my pediatrician. My pediatrician obviously uses your gold standard checklist, um, <laughs> but childhood obesity is a major concern um, and lack of physical activity for pediatricians, I know. So what, what suggestions are coming out from your organization, Leanne? Right, so in building on what Dr. Tyler Garner said, um, we want families to have a schedule and um, you have to have alternatives. You don't wanna beat yourself up if you can't stick to the schedule every single day, but start by having that schedule where there is scheduled family meal time. There is scheduled meal planning time. There is scheduled family activity time. And maybe there can be um, choices and alternatives within that activity time of, you know, are we gonna walk around the block or are we gonna do a hundred jumping jacks or are we going to do you know, something? But having a schedule and also to schedule time for mindfulness, to schedule time for whether it's, it's meditation or your journaling or something, um, especially for those of us that work from home, you know, we now live in our offices and if we don't schedule an end to our work day, we'll keep working. And that's really not healthy for ourselves or for our, our kiddos. Um, our chapter does do once a month, something called Walk with a Doc, which started years ago. This cardiologist, his patients weren't walking enough. So he met them at a public park and went for a walk. And before the pandemic, we used to do these walks in person where pediatricians went to Springs Preserve in Las Vegas or the Marina up in Sparks. and went for a walk. Well, now we've taken them virtually. So we're hoping that families will check in with us once a month. I have a pediatrician who does like a five minute kid friendly health topic talk on all kinds of different health topics. And then my family and I, we tweet the pictures of us walking. No one else ever <laughs> does, but our hope is that other people are walking and out there with their families. But again, it's scheduled second Sunday of every month. Just it's on that schedule. We know that day we're taking a two mile hike around our neighborhood, no matter what. Um, I think that your tip of schedules is so important because I know in the beginning of closures, that was something that kind of got thrown out the window. And then pretty quickly, my husband and I realized we needed to reintroduce it. It's, it's definitely not as tight as it was when we had in-person school, but um, we all need bedtimes and, um, <laughs> and the, those basic, uh, things that kind of keep the, the times and seasons of life going and kids really, um, I know I've seen a huge difference with my kids when I keep to routines. They just, it, it, and the evidence is there, it seems from everything I ever read that it seems that's universal. Mental, physical health providers always say kids need structure and schedules, right? Yes. And routines. Um, so we are almost out of time, but I do, um, one of the things that we didn't touch on, Heidi, that I want to make sure we touch on is that there are um, some people who have concerns about vaccination, whether it's current vaccinations that already exist um, or the potential for a, a future vaccination for COVID. Um, National PTA, we actually were advocating for immunizations for decades. Um, PTA has 
uh, our policy agenda has included that since before it was mandatory for schools. Um, and so, but we also recognize families that there's so much different information out there. So what do you say to those families who are concerned about the safety of vaccinations? Yep. I, I think as a parent, obviously, it's important to be asking questions about everything, you know, that involves your child's health, and that's what your healthcare professional is there for. Um, but we also have extensive information on the Immunized Nevada website. We actually have a whole page, a whole section dedicated to vaccine safety. It has questions on there. It has resources. It actually links to some excellent resources on the site that Leanne mentioned, the Healthy Children site. Um, we really like that site. It's so accessible for parents and it also is available in Spanish as is our site. Our site's also available in Chinese. Um, so we, we really want parents to seek out um, those credible sources. So make sure that what you're reading, you know, is not um, a random site that you haven't heard of or that your aunt sally shared or something you know look at who's uh sharing it where that information is coming from and and then take it back to that healthcare professional and say i saw this i have questions about it can you help me um all of us at Immunize Nevada are parents and or parents of pets. So, or, you know, we've all gotten vaccinated ourselves. So in some way, shape or form, we've all done that same research. We've know those sources, we've been through it ourselves. And so we think we're all resources as well. Um, and I would say for the forthcoming vaccine that will be here, I'm not sure when, but again, um, all of that information about safety studies and the process, um, we are being as transparent as we can with the information that we have and that we're getting. We're sharing it on our site. We have a weekly feature on our blog that takes the top 10 articles from the week that we feel like are important for people based on what they might be seeing in the news. We encourage people to read you know, and check that out. Um, follow us, you know, and just see what we're talking about and the sources that we're sharing. Um, Nevada has great experts. We have amazing healthcare professionals. Um, and I think it's really important for us to be um, honoring that and, and making sure that we're listening to them as well. Thank you. Um, and I think that does lead to a good final question since we are just about out of time. Because I think in this pandemic, one of the things we've seen is it's not just vaccine related, but just in general, when it comes to healthcare guidance, there's a lot of confusion sometimes about what to trust, what not to, evolving guidance. Um, there's you know questions about even some stuff is big questions and other stuff is as a parent, like how do I figure out the difference between allergies and COVID? You know, like there, there's, <laughs> it, it seems like the level of, <laughs> yeah, so like the level of all of these different um, questions that we have. And then, you know, obviously we love social media. We're sharing this on social media. We love the virtual, but there's positives and negatives to what's on social media, right? Um, so how do we find good science-based information? Um, maybe Leanne, this is a good question for you, but it, Dr. Tyler Gardner, if you want to hop in or Heidi, feel free to too. Like, where should as parents and families we go for guidance about healthcare questions, whether it's mental health or behavioral health or physical health, so that we can get the best information possible? Sure, sure. So this year, the American Academy of Pediatrics is celebrating its 90th birthday. So it's been around for 90 years. It's nearly 70,000 pediatricians, mostly in the US and Canada, but internationally. And um, their uh, parenting website does have the most up-to-date information. They answer that question about flu, allergies, and COVID. How can you tell which one? And um, while there are a few pointers, the truth is, is that if you, if you appear with any of those symptoms, they're going to test you for COVID because they can't rule it out. Um, so, um, so and, and there's another emphasis there on the prevention, right? So if you are socially distancing, if you are wearing your masks, if you are getting the flu shot, if you are putting in the ways of um, preventing exposure, it does make treatment 
a little bit easier on the other end or, or avoidable altogether. But the American Academy of also, Pediatrics also encourages families to pay attention to their local health, public health departments, right? So every county and the state have public health professionals who are studying what's happening right here, right in our communities and what is um, the best advice based on how much virus is out there. How, and I know it is overwhelming because the recommendations change as the data changes, but that's why these sites are kept up to date weekly, sometimes even daily, because they want to give the best recommendations based on the newest information that we are gathering. And it's, um, it's, it's why treatments now are so much better than they were back in, in April, right? That we have, physicians have gotten a handle on the more basic aspects of, uh, of a disease that we didn't understand six months ago. Yeah, that's really good information. Anybody want to add anything else? I would just I concur you're... with that. Yeah, I think um, that's the, the challenge of dealing with a new virus in real time. And it can be overwhelming and confusing, but again, um, you know, I'll just reiterate, we do have incredible experts locally and, you know, as Leanne said, yeah, they are making decisions and, and those recommendations based on what's happening for us in our community. And I think that's what's most important. Um, and yeah, I think we know it's a challenge. We know um, it's, I mean, it's overwhelming and exhausting at times, but I think if we all do our part, we've heard the governor say it, I don't know how many times, right? But, you know, I think even his press conference yesterday um, was so important because if we do our part, then our kids will be able to go back to school, right? And they'll be able to maintain and, and get back to some of those um, normalcy and, and some of those activities. And I think we all want that no matter how old our kids are. I mean, I have a college freshman. Um, he needs that just as much as, as those younger kids too. So I think just like Leanne said, reiterating all the things we can do now while we're waiting um, for that forthcoming vaccine. Um, there And there's still gonna be a piece of that puzzle, even when the vaccine comes, we're still gonna have to be practicing these other preventative efforts. And um, and uh, yeah, we're all in it together and we can all help each other through it. Yeah. Well, thank you. I know you guys have had very long days and I appreciate you spending, making it even longer by spending another hour at night with us um, for this. Um, but thank you for sharing so much information. I will go back and pull out many of the website resources that we talked about and add them to this post so that people can easily uh, click on those because I think we covered just some tremendous ones that I want to make sure people all have access to easily. Um, but I appreciate all the work that you guys are doing in our community. And I think one of the biggest takeaways for me is whether it's the pandemic or general children's health, so much of it comes back to the fact that everything's interconnected, right? And these are community issues. Um, and that if we as a community prioritize the needs of our kids and the needs of our community, um, that people will have better outcomes. Um, and so uh, it, I do think that our next legislative session is going to be challenging. Um, but I think when we make investments in our kids, it pays off in the long run. Um, it always does. And so look forward to working with all of you to continue those discussions <laughs> and that fight for resources for our kids. Um, but thank you. Thank you again for joining us tonight and for all of you who watched with us as well. Thanks for Have having me. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.